This is the Inner Chief Podcast, episode 176. I used to remind myself that in a crew of about 60 people, at very best, I probably possessed no more than 2% of the capacity of that crew. And, and my job really was to use that 2%, my knowledge, skill and experience, to draw out the other 98% and make the most of their knowledge and skill and experience. So that's how I used to try and try and think of that. G'day, this is the Inner Chief Podcast, episode 176, with Peter Scott, former Chief of Submarines for the Royal Australian Navy, on leadership in high stakes environments and keeping purpose alive in your team. I'm your host, Greg Layton, and I believe that if you desire more purpose, influence, and impact in your career, then learning from the masters coupled with consistent personal growth, is instrumental. Every Thursday, I'll bring you a deep diving interview with a CEO or guru about their personal journey. Together, we will break down the mindsets, the strategies, and the micro skills they use to rise to the top and leave a lasting legacy. Then every Monday, I post a short, sharp mini-sode and YouTube video with the best advice I can muster to help you become the chief of your career and life. Now, chief, if you're yet to rate the episode and subscribe, I hope you'll do so soon. It helps others see the magnificent value that the chiefs and gurus on the show bring to their life and career. So make sure you hit subscribe on your podcast app now, give it a five-star rating if you think it's worthy, and leave a short review about your favorite episode. In this episode, we meet Peter Scott. Peter joined the Royal Australian Navy as a midshipman in 1983. He had active service in Iraq, the Persian Gulf and Afghanistan and was awarded the Commendation for Distinguished Service in the Australia Day Honours, having previously been decorated with the Conspicuous Service Cross. Commodore Scott served as Director General Submarines and Head of the Submarine Profession and was recently appointed as the inaugural Director of Defence, New South Wales. Peter Scott lives in Sydney and enjoys spending time with his wonderful wife and daughter and their family dogs, and his outdoor interests include things like cycling and competing in the occasional ultra marathon. In this episode, he shares plenty of incredible stories from his time in the service and outlines the five essential elements to submarine command and how they apply to business. Peter's five essential elements of submarine command are taught across the Navy, and they include combining knowledge and skill with experience, exercising lucid judgment, making sound decisions, providing effective direction, and inspiring your people. Well, I am joined here by Peter Scott, former Chief of Submarines, a career in the Navy, and now an executive coach. Peter, thank you for coming on The Inner Chief. Yeah, thanks very much, Greg. Really happy to be here and have a chat. Peter, we've got a wonderful tradition here at the Inner Chief where we love to know where where our chiefs come from. Can you tell us a bit of a story that sums up your childhood and early life? Yeah, you bet. I I had a wonderful childhood. Loving parents, a large family, grew up on the lower north shore of Sydney, excellent schools, plenty of sport, really blessed and privileged in a a lot of different ways. I think one of the highlights for me was the the years I spent mucking around in in boats down at the, the rowing sheds at my high school. I was, a, I was a tough enough kid, but there wasn't a lot of me, so I used to, I used to cox the, um, the fours and the eights. And I, I grew to really love rowing as a sport. And I look back on it now as, you know, the epitome of, you know, reward for hard work, doing your bit as part of a team, uh, but also having a bit of fun along the way. And it captures a, what, a lot of what my childhood was like. And funnily enough, I think it captures a bit of what my um, life as an adult would, would also become. What was your first ever job, Peter? Um, I had to think back, but it was at a local bakery and uh, I was very proud to have a paying job, but I grew to really not enjoy swapping the decks of that bakery at the end of the day. <laughs> flour over the course of a working day in a bakery gets everywhere. Yeah, it was a, it was a, I've probably done worse things since, but um, I grew to detest the sight of flour for a while. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it can do that to you, mate. What was the uh, what was the going rate for a handboy and whatever it is at the bakery? No, no idea. 
no, no idea. No, yeah. no idea. No. <laughs> Fast forward a couple yeah. of years. This is a real is a really important question. I always love to know what people's first ever car was. What was your yep. first car? So it was a 1968 uh, Valiant sedan, 1200 bucks. I don't know how much that cost. Yeah. Nice. Um, I had it for six months. I hadn't paid it off yet, and I I lost control of the thing and took it off a small bridge. <laughs> ended up, yeah, ended up upside down in a in a creek. I walked away from that one, uh, pretty lucky to do so. But yeah, it sent me broke. I think I got fifty bucks for scrap and paid a hundred bucks for towing. And is that why you ended up in the submarines, was, mate? Or yeah, I couldn't get around. Got a yeah. taste for metal underwater. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Um, so it was a bit of a it was a bit of a grim day. But, yeah, um, I can't imagine. You know, listen, I'd love to hear a bit about this you know, long life in in the navy, in particular in submarines. Before we talk mm-hmm. about what the experience was like, I'd like to know what 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 on earth draws you to a career in the submarines. I mean, I think a lot of people would say, "Well, wow, it's a it's an interesting decision to make." What was going through your mind that said, "You know what, I want to I want to go towards the subs." So when I left school, I joined the Navy, but I didn't join the Navy to join submarines. So I think the reason I I joined the Navy was influenced from my my, my male role models as I was growing up. So I had a granddad who was a a World War I vet, one uncle who was a World War II vet, uh, an uncle who was a priest, and my dad was a, a lifelong public servant. For me, just that notion of service, came very naturally and, and was quite dominant. So I think that's probably what sort of led me into a life in the Navy, perhaps a bit of a desire to just get out and adventure and, and see some stuff as well. Early days in the Navy, I did a lot of different things. I spent time in patrol boats, uh, on a destroyer, uh, some time in the flagship, some time in the training ship, and it was all all great fun. But I also um, met my wife-to-be when I was still a, a young lad, a midshipman. And I came to realise pretty quickly that, um, you know, there was a serious side to naval service. Clearly, it was going to demand some hard work, but also it was going to demand some personal sacrifice, um, both for me and also for, you know, the people that I cared for. I decided that as long as I was in the Navy, I would commit to doing, you know, the most effective and the most worthwhile service that I could. Now, this is in the early 80s. So, I had images of uh, the Argentinian battleship Belgrano being destroyed and sunk by Conqueror in my mind. And, you know, there was just no competition for that as a demonstration of decisive sea power. So things like that were probably an influence and, and um, you know, led me to want to serve in the most potent arm of the Australian Navy. Um, and for me, that was... That was submarines. Peter, I recently read your paper on submarine command, and I want to just steal a little bit of text from it and then ask you to talk about submarines and what it is you've come to love about them. And I think you've just intimated to it now, but you say in this text that it's both a, a submarine is both a symbol and a tool of national will. What I'm describing is something much more than a pressure hull with a suite of sensors and weapons. It is a living, breathing, and vibrant thing creature of the sea, quite literally sinewy and steely at once. Can, can you talk more to that? What, what, is it, what is a submarine, like getting to the essence of what it truly is and why it's so important? Sure. Submarines operate on the, on the very basic premise of stealth. They are extremely difficult to counter. They're difficult to locate, they're difficult to track, and they're, they're difficult to attack. But they are also immensely potent so you know one torpedo from one of our submarines break a warship into the bottom in two pieces so it's that combination of both stealth uh, and defensive capability that really make them the nation's principal strategic deterrent you know when you put a submarine to sea you cause commanders in other navies to stop and think so that fundamental purpose of acting as a strategic deterrent for the nation is really strong and powerful. I think another part for me though is is the challenge. So life in a life in a warship at sea is hard, but life at sea in a submarine is harder. There's an added layer to every dimension of challenge. It, it doesn't matter whether it's operating with 
passive sensors rather than active sensors or operating at depth, operating with very limited communications and most often in complete isolation from, from other units, you know, including friendly units. So it's, it's a really challenging existence and profession. Um, and I guess I don't mind a challenge. But I think the, the key is the, the people that you get to work with because you get an opportunity to work with and to lead people who are attracted in their own ways to those very same things, to that same purpose um, and those same extreme challenges. And they're not just attracted to those things, but they're willing to actually step forward and volunteer and, and act on that attraction. So that's how I'd sort of wrap it up. You know, there's, it's the purpose, the challenge, and the people that, that meet those. Yeah. Yeah, I, we're, we're certainly going to spend like the majority of today talking about that. What, what's it actually like inside a submarine? I mean, most most of our, uh, each, you know, the average human's experience of being inside a submarine was the hunt for it October, you know. <laughs> what's it like? What does yep. it sound like? What does it feel like? Um, what is the appearance? The hunt for Red October is uh, not a bad movie, but it's it's Hollywood. If if you want to know, if you want to get a sense of what life at sea in a submarine is like, um, albeit this is during wartime, the German production Dust Boot, you, you just can't go past it. So that's a that's a movie, Dust Boot. Cool. Um, I know the one, yeah. yeah. It's a cracker. Anyway, life at sea in submarines, as, as something to live in, quite simply, they're bloody awful. They're atrocious. If you look at most people's view of submarines is an external view, unless it's a Hollywood view. So if you look at a submarine from the outside, they are deceptively simple. Um, they are sleek. They are black. It looks like there's nothing to them. But when you get inside a submarine, they're completely different. They're the total opposite. They couldn't be more complex. And certainly until you become used to them, they couldn't be more confronting. Everything is hard and everything is close. So they're, they're designed and built to meet the demands of the sea and the pressure of a dived environment. And fundamentally, they are sensor and weapon systems. So they're built for effectiveness and efficiency. They are not built for comfort and they're not built for aesthetics. They are jam-packed with uh, high-powered machinery, high-voltage cables, high-pressure air, high-pressure hydraulic systems, high-data combat systems and high-explosive weapons. So there's, there's not an inch of spare space on, on a submarine. The sounds on a submarine, we, we have a particular relationship with sound. Mostly on board a boat, it's very quiet because sound is energy. Sound as energy gets transmitted very well through water. And any noise that we make can be detected and becomes a threat to our stealth. Um, so we, we work very hard to, to be very quiet. But there are other sounds out, out there that, that contrast. So the sound from the ocean, the surrounding oceans, you know, what we can detect and what we can analyse is what gives us much of our situational awareness, our understanding of what's happening around mm. us. And there's some absolute magic to some of those sounds, you know, listening to shrimp and dolphins and whales and on the surface of the ocean, waves breaking on a coastline. But, of course, what so we look back for... you up there. Come back, yeah. listening to shrimp? Oh, yeah, yeah. There's, I've never heard of that. The oceans are alive with sound. Mm. You can often hear shoals of fish feeding and, and shrimp wow. feeding. And, wow, that's uh, remarkable. Yeah, yeah. Can, can I ask a question? Uh, I'm trying to put this into words but or create some sort of scale. Like what, what is it that you can hear that's, that's remarkable? Like can you hear a pin drop from across a room type thing or, you know, like how far away would that shoal of fish be that you could hear could that be 100 200 meters like can you hear a whale from five kilometers what what, what is the kind of give us some scale of what it is yep, you can... yep. so it, it varies a lot and generally it, it varies most um with frequency so very low frequency sounds can travel for hundreds of kilometers through mm. the ocean the higher the frequency the shorter the the range that sound will, will travel things like active sonars that would be designed to look for and hunt submarines, mm. very often they'll have different modes where they transmit at, at lower frequencies and then higher frequencies and higher rates. And often you can tell what sort of search a warship is conducting, mode that his sonar is in. 
torpedoes are the same. They will have a search mode, which, you know, sends out a ping and then mm-hmm. listens within a certain amount of time. And if they're, if they're looking for a contact, you know, that will, it'll allow quite a bit of time for that sound to travel out and then come back from a return. Once a torpedo, an active torpedo locks onto a contact and as the range closes, often the, the, the rate at which the pinging is happening is, mm. is increased so that it can track um, sure. you know, the target. A moment of delight, it would happen often over a career but not frequently that you would be at periscope depth in your submarine and on the periscope, so keeping a lookout um, above the surface. And often um, whales and dolphins will come to play with the submarine. Um, you've seen dolphins, um, you know, leaping in front of a ship before, and they'll do the same with the submarine. But you'd have this delightful environment where you could see the dolphin above and below the water as your periscope dipped up and uh, above and below the waves, and you could hear them chattering to each other as they played around the submarine. Yeah, <laughs> so. Very pleasant, yeah. thing, something like that. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Anyhow. As you say, delightful. <laughs> okay. But let's talk more about what it's like during uh, more intense times, just for about 10 minutes. And then I want to yep. talk about what it's yep. like when you get to times when it's like a, a protracted deployment that's not necessarily going your way and it's a bit challenging. Yeah. Sort of a bit yep. like what some people are experiencing right now with COVID. You know, and anyway, so let's talk about. You, you, you gave an example in your paper where you spoke about several weeks of training, safety training called "Eyes Only Attacking" in the fjords of Norway. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit right. about that? Because that was all about you know fishing boats and ferries and tight navigation. And what is that like? And what are the yeah. margins for yeah. error? Uh, right, <laughs> uh, <laughs> slim. So look, I've, I've been to Norway on boats a couple of times, but the time you're referring to there was um, during my submarine command qualifying course, so a course called Perisher that you need to do to actually take command of, um, of one of our boats. That course is about five months long and it's run over phases at sea and ashore, so training and simulators and so on ashore and then and then out to sea to, to do stuff for real. And it's fantastic because you do anything and everything that it's possible to do in a submarine over that, over that time. Great opportunity to learn, but it's not a video game. You know, the ships and the rocks and the people are, are very hard, and the intensity and the pressure are intentionally quite real. So the margins for error are, are slim. The objective there is to manoeuvre your submarine through a slips using only very limited exposure on your periscope and position the submarine so that you can deliver an attack against the main target, which might be a tanker or an aircraft carrier. But what you're actually doing is you're demonstrating that you understand your limits when it comes to safety from collision uh, and grounding. Teacher, who's the, the commander who's running the course, purposely generates really demanding situations to um, to test this. So they took us to these fjords um, in Norway, which were just frantic with fishing vessels and boats, very tight navigationally, all sorts of um, you know tidal currents and so on. Very often they were cloaked in fog or snow or both, depending on which direction you looked. Um, and these warships are charging around at full speed. So timing is critical and, and it literally comes down to the second. You're trying to stay at periscope depth, but clearly you can't afford to have a collision with a warship. Uh, that would end badly for both of you. So you're often ducking the submarine under approaching warships and then bringing them back up to pursue the, the target. Wow. How deep is um, periscope depth? How about? On, on our boats, the keel is about 60 feet, 20 metres below the... Sure. The surface and the top of the fin is, you know, probably um, 15 feet below the surface and the periscope mm. reaching the surface. But, you know, if you need to dive under these warships, um, you know, I've had ships come directly over the top with as little as 10 feet between their crashing <sighs> propellers and the top of your submarine. And they, they, well, that's close. Um, they shake the living daylights out of the submarine and they're thunderously loud at, at that sort of range. Yeah. Um, so you you know you're alive. <laughs> wow. That's remarkable. Peter, that you, your paper on submarine command and what, what you call the Perisher uh, program is, is, is a remarkable read. And in that, you talk about five key components of um, or essential elements of submarine command, and they are <laughs> combined knowledge and skill with experience. Two is exercise lucid judgment. Three is make sound decisions. Four is provide effective directions and five is inspire your people. 
sounds to me like a handbook for running a company as well. Uh, <laughs> Let's just let's just go through each of those in a little bit of depth, if that's all right, and perhaps a bit of a description and maybe a bit of a story around each of those would be wonderful. Sure. Combining knowledge and skill with experience. So I, th- I think there's a couple of parts to that. One one is bringing to the fore all of your knowledge and skill and experience as relevant to you know whatever the challenge of the day. But but that's not really the important piece. The important piece is bringing the combined knowledge and skill and experience, the total of those from within your ship's company to the fore, so your own and others. I used to remind myself that in a crew of about 60 people, at very best, I probably possessed no more than 2% of the capacity of that crew. And and my job really was to use that 2%, my knowledge, skill and experience, to draw out the other 98% and make the most of their knowledge and skill and experience. So that's how I used to try and try and think of that. Mm. The judgment thing often seem as though on a submarine at sea you're very isolated from inputs and data and so on, but it, it's never actually the case. So in your day-to-day business, there's no end of inputs. Um, there's no end of considerations that you might make of advice that you might seek or take, technical data that you might, you know, consume. Exercising lucid judgment for me is about the weighting and the importance that you place on different data or different advice. It's about the selection of that data. It's about being open to, you know, the right sources of input. And it's about being aware of your biases, understanding where you tend to resist advice from one sailor over the other or where you tend to look for anecdotal advice or data rather than, you know, concrete statistical data or mm. whatever, whatever your biases are. Something that proves, um, what, something that proves your, your theory rather than... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plain yeah. Fact, you know, oh, I need, that, that proves my theory right. that chips over there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that helps me make this decision. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's really important that you exercise judgment, but that it's it's lucid. That lucid yeah. bit, bit always helped me to be a bit more considerate about my weightings mm. and my openness and my bias yeah. and so on. Mm. Um, so how does that link to then making sound decisions? This is the third element. They're very close yeah, in mind, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. So I guess the first thing I'm doing there is is drawing the distinction between judgment and decisions. Yeah. Um, and there's there's a lot of dimensions to a quality decision. You know, you've got to make the right at the right, ideally for the right reason. Not always. If you make the right call at the right time for the wrong reason, you might get away with it. But ideally, you make it for the right reason. And fundamentally, I look at this as a change of state. Making sound decisions is about making a clear shift from deliberation to decision. It's kind of really just acknowledging and honouring the importance of actually making decisions and not letting things drift along when they don't, when they should not. It's about changing state from vacillation to resolve. Clearly, to exercise command, you must make decisions. So that's how I used to think about the moment in time. And you might make a decision that leaves some options open, but you're making that decision Mm. to leave some options open. Yeah, true. I mean, there's two little analogies that jump to my mind. One is um, someone once said to me that not acting or, or not making a decision is actually a decision to, to not right. act. You know, so so if you, you look at something and you don't respond to someone's behaviour or situation or numbers that are coming in, that's actually a decision. But a lot of the time yep. we don't frame it that way in our heads. The, the second is uh, I, I think it was another who was one of the early CEOs on the show, said he got a lesson from his chairman once. And uh, the chairman was, a, I think, an old British aristocrat. He flew in from the UK and he turned up, I think he even had a knighthood and he, there was a problem in the business. It was obvious that it was there and he, this old uh, gentleman just sort of said, you're dancing around the issue like it's like it's something to admire. God, uh-huh. God do something, you know. Like you're almost right, standing right. back watching this thing and he said, just do something. <laughs> You know, act. Make a uh, call. Yeah. Make a call. Do something, you know, and um, that, that's interesting. Uh, you know, I, I really love the, the the distinction there you made between judgment and then decisions and honouring the decision-making process. 
that's got real. I think that's that's some of a true chief. That's wonderful. Look, let's talk about then providing effective direction. So you've you've made some judgment. Call you've used combined yep. knowledge and experience. I'm seeing how this linked together so beautifully now. Ju- you ex- exercising lucid judgment. Then you make a decision, and you make a decision. Then you've got to bring it to life, which is providing right. effective direction. So providing direction can be pretty simple. Mm-hmm. You can satisfy yourself that you've provided direction pretty quickly and pretty easily. You've made your direct your decision and you've told someone about it. Mm. Um, but there's there's more to it. The key word in all of that is the effect of direction. Have you got the attention of your people when you're providing them this direction? Have you tested how well you have communicated that decision? Effectiveness might come down to timeliness. You know, are you are you providing the direction too early or too soon? Clarity. Is it, is it simple and able to be understood? Is there a shared and common understanding? Because I can, I can give you direction, Greg, and I understand what it is I want you to do. But what you take from what I ask you to do might be something completely different. So it's making sure that you find the ways to test the effectiveness of your communication. And I think probably the, the last bit, which maybe should come first, is um, how readily can the direction that you've given be executed is it actually effective in that? Can it be executed? Can they achieve the direction that you've provided? So there's a few few different parts to yeah. that, but mm. you know the decision will just live in your head until you provide direction. Mm. The important piece is making sure that it's effective direction. Yeah, and it's something really easy to to get wrong. I mean, how many times um, have, have we all given a direction and someone's nodded their head? Yep, got your boss. And right. gone off, and then they come back, and you're like, "Why on earth did you do that?" Like that, right? right. That, you know, like, yeah. and you can be convinced that, "Oh my god, that person has terrible set of ears on them." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> As yeah. opposed to looking at the mirror and asking yourself, "Well, what, what, how did you come up with that particular delegation or particular description of the task?" You know, and, and I've always said people are incredibly logical in their behaviour. Right? They're, uh-huh. they're they're doing their judgment and decision making and taking action based on yep. what's provided for them. Um, and it's just something quality you expected. Um, <laughs> you know, unfortunately. Yeah, you've got to, you you've got to kind of look in your own eye first. Yeah. 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 Well, you said, Greg, you know, you've got to bring that decision to life. And I, I think that's where the, the last bit comes in, the inspiring mm. your people. And that, for me, is about connecting your people to your decision. So, Greg, it's interesting that you spoke about bringing the decision to life, and I think that's what the the fifth point, inspiring your people, is about. It's about connecting your people to your decision. Uh, Leaders are often asking difficult things of their people. They might be um, physically or intellectually or emotionally demanding things that we ask of our people. Uh, We might ask that they um, sacrifice make sacrifices. Sometimes we ask things about people that they don't intuitively believe are worthwhile or even achievable. So inspiring your people is about connecting your people to your decision. Fundamentally, the best way to do that, I think, is to connect your decision to their purpose and and your shared purpose, whatever that might be. And if people can see the rationale um, between, you know, I've made this decision, I've given you this direction, this it, this is how it aligns with the really big thing that we're trying to achieve, mm. then that'll help them get on board and go away and execute. Okay, Chiefs, more from Peter in a minute. But a few weeks ago, I interviewed Kevin Gaskell, former MD of Porsche, BMW and Lamborghini. And here's what Kevin had to say when you're out there trying to set big goals and take your business into the future. And I would call them up, hi, my name's Kevin Gaskell, I'm Chief Executive of Porsche. When was the last time you drove a Porsche? I've never driven a Porsche. Would you like to borrow one? Sorry, who is this? Yeah, my name's Mm. Kevin. Are you serious? Yeah, would you like to borrow a car? Yeah, I'd love to. I said, okay, here's the deal. We'll deliver it to you. You can keep it for a week, but you have to drive it back to the factory and interview me at the end of it. Mm. That's the deal. Tell them about the brand. Mm. And what they could see was we weren't really this arrogant, yeah. Germanic brand that, that the media had made us out to be. We were a bunch of very passionate car enthusiasts who loved what we were doing and who were mm. changing the business. And that transformed the perception. And, and four years later, we were number one in customer satisfaction. We were the most profitable car business in the market. 
You can listen to that cracking chat with Kevin Gaskell by going to chiefmaker.com forward slash 173 or just scroll up on your iTunes app there and you will find it. Righto, Chiefs, let's get back to Peter Scott. Peter, you say in the paper, and Peter, we're going to make that paper available. I'll put a link in the show notes for people that want to read it, and I really recommend people do read it. And now that I'm interviewing you more about it, I'm thinking I want to read it again. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Peter, in this, you talk quite a lot about purpose and in a few different contexts about, and this is so important about this inspire your people piece. In one example, you talk about what happens when your purpose is placed at severe risk. And I'll just start off with a bit of the story. It said, in command of Deschanel, is that how you say it? Deschanel. 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 Um, You had a proven platform. Our purpose was to prove and put into action the operational capabilities of the class. This purpose was placed at severe risk when the submarine suffered a major flood during final preparations for a series of regional developments. We were deep at deep diving depth in a very deep piece of water when a flex hose on the auxiliary seawater cooling system burst into the lower motor room, resulting in the submarine flooding at a rate of a tonne a second. To paint a picture that is equivalent of 2,500 schooners of beer ripping into your submarine every second with no chance to tap or dry until somebody does something, that puts your initial purpose, (laughs) testing the operational capabilities of the class, completely at risk. Can you tell us what happened next and how did you get the crew back on track? What happens next? The, the question that should come a little earlier is what happens first, um, and that is that everything changes. You go from knowing your environment, almost complete precision, and knowing the state of your submarine in intimate detail to endless unknowns, just question on question. You know, what is the rate and the extent of the flood? Um, has it been stopped? What is the state of all those various complex systems that I mentioned earlier? Damage or casualties or fatalities um, have you suffered? And what's the ongoing risk? That's the first thing that happens. <laughs> mm-hmm. The one thing that, that we knew immediately was that we wanted to get to the surface and stay there. And it was really difficult um, getting to the roof. We were, we were looking for every breath of air um, that we could blow uh, every turn of the screw, the propeller, every pump that could draw suction, suction and reduce the weight of the boat. Mm-hmm. And once we did get to the surface, um, it took us about eight hours to get back alongside, and that was an eight-hour battle. Uh, back, back alongside, well, meaning? Oh, so we, we were off the coast of, um, of Western Australia, and, and mm. it took us about eight hours. Thankfully, we weren't very far from home. Took us about eight hours to get back alongside the, the mm. base. Mm. Yeah. What, what you need at a time like that is is discipline and method, critical analysis, clear thinking. You need all of that knowledge, skill, and experience mm. coming from, and exceptional teamwork. And it's really important that you do the right thing in the right order to get yourself back to a safe and known state of the submarine and its, and its systems. So look, we um, you know, we we survived that difficult day. I think to bring it back to purpose, that was a, a difficult day. It was a, a major flood at sea. It didn't remove my obligation to, you know, achieve the deployments that the operational commander mm. set me. Um, so my role from the outset was to recover that situation and and find the ways to drive through to achieve, you know, that mission. So the flood wasn't our purpose. It was a challenge we had to deal with. But the deployments beyond remained our our purpose. A lesson that I take from that time to you know connect it to the COVID pandemic and, and yeah, something we've yeah. been talking mm. about relates to connections. To fully recover from that difficult situation took a lot more than I had at my disposal. You know, it took the efforts, yes, of the, the ship's company, but also the squadron staff and fleet staff, maybe senior leadership were involved. There were accident investigators, design engineers, um, you know, tradesmen who repaired the damage and strengthened the submarine. And even once we understood the problem, it, it took a docking and some material modifications and changes to the way we, we did things, changes to procedure. So to achieve all that and still achieve our purpose meant generating or regenerating lots of meaningful, meaningful connections with people who could lean in and and support us. It meant recruiting them to our purpose and bringing them in Mm. as 
as part of the solution so that we could still go away and achieve what it was that we needed to, mm. to achieve. So constancy of purpose and really a spread of that purpose was the mm. key for us there. Mm. You know, one, one thing that you mentioned there, which I think is so important, uh, two days ago I had a, 10 CEOs in this meeting I call the Council of Chiefs, and and what one thing that really was interesting was that they were all looking for those connections um, right. because while while we're physically isolated, the worst thing any leader, be a CEO or any any leader in a business, is to isolate themselves from the expertise that is out there in the world. Uh-huh. Right now, there's a lot of people willing to help anyone. Yeah, right. To pay for it, right? You know, and and <laughs> I, I was watching some of these CEOs offer generously their time to help someone essentially fix a broken hose in their business, right? Or or save a sinking submarine, which is sort of what some of some of the organisations facing. And if you are stuck. In a really tough time, don't don't isolate because uh, you know make those connections as you said. Because right. even if you don't have the you know the might of the navy behind you, create it through yeah. your connections and your network. Like you know there are experts out there. There are other people who who have knowledge and wisdom and experience. Look, this is the perfect example of that. You know, here I am learning from someone who's been through so much. He's got so much wisdom to share, and this is a perfect example of essentially creating your own navy, right? Uh, um, yep, to help yep. you stop a sinking ship. Okay, so we've got a situation where um, something like a, a, a COVID hits, and the, the, all of a sudden the the ship is sinking, and you save the ship. But there are other times that are different to that when it's slow and, and there's no urgency, and it's gone. And there are a lot of organisations, or even people within organisations, that right now are just they're just treading water and they're not going anywhere. And you, you told this great story about when you're in Collins, uh, leading this col- command of Collins for a year and a half, and what you thought would take three months had taken 18 months. And, and the internet has been this long, protracted set of setbacks. So when you yeah. get in a scenario like that where it, it just feels like you're just never winning every time you come around a corner, there's a new headwind or, or something that's going to stop you, how do you maintain the morale in that time to get people moving? That can be really difficult. <laughs> and that, that circumstance was, you know, if we'd known that we were going to be there for 18 months, we would have managed it completely different. But it, it was literally, you know, a three-month delay and then another three-month delay. Mm. And um, as I'm talking about it, you know, it, it's kind of like, you know, the drought and then the fires and then the COVID thing, you know. Yeah. Um, but look, so there's maybe a couple of parts to this. I think the first, you know, as a leader is it is about vision. It's a matter of vision. It's about sitting down and imagining for yourself, yes, the, the difficult things and the challenges you might face, but also really the the opportunities and the success that you might enjoy. And and they might be a long way away, but if you, if you can't see them as the leader, then you, you're never going to be able to recruit your people to, to, to keep rolling through. I think to do this, you often need to take yourself well beyond the present, literally carve out the time and the space to see through the immediacy of what you're dealing with and to envisage circumstances, alternate paradigms, positive futures that you can, you know, drive towards. But, you know, the sort of saying that if you can imagine it, you can do it, you know, that's that's not literally true, but it's it's a great starting point, I mm-hmm. think, if you if you're mm-hmm. in a bit of a quagmire. Mindset, I think, is really important, you know, choosing a positive mindset. You know, just taking a positive approach will help you to develop option sets and to build patterns of success. And it will shape your language and it will shape how you act and that will definitely impact on you people. One of the things, the distinction I like to make, the distinction between leading in uncertain times and leading through uncertain times so you know both of those allow you to pay attention to the present but one the first one leading in uncertain times it can be kind of static and mired just that simple change to leading through uncertain time it's got a sense of motion and and it allows a sense of destination and hope and and often it's just those very simple differences but that definitely comes from choosing a positive mindset um, and exercising some vision and imagination. Mm-hmm. Peter, something I want to ask you about your own journey as a leader, 
some of your descriptions of leadership and these five pillars that you've de- spoken about and positive mindset and there must have been some times in your own journey as a leader where your own psychology or you were a bit down or it wasn't as easy as you thought and in your own cabin when no one else is around you're thinking, Christ, how do I survive this? Um, yeah. And I, like, can you tell us a bit about that? Because when you open the door and you go out, you want to appear to be in control of things because everyone wants to look at the commander and see that. But where do you share the vulnerability in that? Or, or is that for a later time? Like, I think there's, there's absolutely value in demonstrating vulnerability around the right things and at the right time. And there's absolutely there's danger in presenting a completely invulnerable persona as or character mm. as a leader. So in the submarine context, you know, we spoke about Perisher. So one of the things that Perisher as a course does is it kind of gives you a stamp of approval. And and the sailors under your command, they know that's, you know, one of the most demanding, you know, military courses in the world. And if their captain has passed that course, he knows his shit and he'll keep them safe and he'll bring them home. So it gives you that, it gives you that stamp of approval. And that lasts for about 30 seconds once you walk on board. Because <laughs> then they're they're saying, okay, we know he's past perisher, but we're judging him on what we're seeing. It, it can be that if you present yourself as perfect and have all the answers, then you can generate an environment where your people aren't willing to offer advice or correct you when they think you're getting it wrong or whatever. And that can be really, really dangerous because none of us are infallible and um, it only takes one person to kill a submarine, you know, if that's the captain because he hasn't listened to people or that's the captain because he's taught them not to give them advice. You know, either way, it can be disastrous. Demonstrating vulnerability, I think you just want to be selective and conscious as you do that. There have been times when I have engineered demonstrations of of vulnerability precisely to do that, precisely to help people see that, hey, the boss didn't get that right. Maybe there's other things he won't get right. Maybe he does need my advice on this. Um, Maybe I, I do have something to contribute. One of the things I've noticed as you've been talking is you appear to have a really good understanding of your own decision-making process, uh, the biases. You've spoken about finding, creating space to think about the vision and the future. So what what's clear to me is you've got your own discipline, the way, like almost, you know, self-regulation of your own thoughts, uh, planning the way you're going to respond, being conscious how, what is your discipline? Do you, do you sit down regularly? Do you journal? Um, how do you manage that? Because that's the bit that's going to, when you start to go off track a bit, that's the bit that, you know, catches you again. How, how do yeah. you do that? So there's plenty of that slapped in here, you know, from day one at Naval College. <laughs> <laughs> and look, I think it, it's, it is a journey. You, you've used that word a couple of times. It's mm-hmm. a journey. I'm a different leader today to the leader that I was as a 18-year-old midshipman. I'm a different leader today. Uh, to the leader I was as a 32-year-old captain. And I have probably learnt over time to be more self-aware, to do a better job of self-regulation and so on. Some of the things I do now, I used to journal quite religiously at sea and I used to fail to journal quite religiously at home. (laughs) I do keep um, just at the moment, a gratitude journal once a week. I, I look to sit down, just capture some of those things that I'm I'm grateful for. Uh, I've got a pretty a pretty good regime now of just kicking off my day. I get up at the same time every day. I do the same things over the first you know half hour or so. Um, Can you first tell us what that is? Constructive thing I do every day is yeah. So I'm I'm up ablutions. I sit down and, and do 10 minutes of meditation, not so much to centre myself, but at the moment to, to to train my mind that little bit better to be conscious of thoughts, emotions and sensations and so on. I have a personal mantra about the things that are important to me and how I want to be, get out the door and I either go for a run or go for a ride or, or I do some, some yoga so that I've done something physical. And then you know, sort of often into the day. Exercise is really important to me. 
I, uh, <laughs> my wife will tell you that um, take that to some extremes. I don't know. But I do like to. I just know that I function better. I'm better off. I'm happier if I've been out and, and mm. done a few things. Mm. And there's probably been some times in my life where the absence of that has led to other habits which haven't been as productive. Yeah, um, sure. You know, some, some heavy drinking and, and stuff. You know, eventually you learn from that. <laughs> Yes, I think we both um, have gone down the path of ultramarathoning and found yeah. that to be a release of of many sorts. And, and funnily enough, when I was at university, I was the president of the Beer Appreciation Society and seven or eight years later I was running <laughs> ultramarathons and not drinking at all. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, what, no, what, no. Happened, what happened to no. another bit about extremes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I do enjoy the, yeah. uh, the ultras. I think um, mm. probably... Uh, it comes back to that, not so much purpose, but certainly the challenge bit. I, yeah. I don't mind challenging myself and I don't mind setting a long-term challenge. Mm. Um, and it doesn't really matter if it means anything at all to anyone else. Um, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I enjoy that. Yeah, stuff. I, I found with those sorts of events, it, it matters nothing if it, if it really matters to anybody else, even if you're raising money for a charity. Or, because when you're out there, it's only between you and you. Um, right. And you yeah. need to find those wells deep within you to get through those races because if you don't have those yeah, yeah. wells of motivation and you just you'll talk yourself out of it, you know, like just something that popped into my mind there, Greg, and just connecting the you know, the long difficult times with the running and, and how you might manage people and manage morale and manage yourself when, when you're going through a long difficult time. This will sound a little bit perverse, but one of my favorite ultra running mantras is it will get worse before it gets worse um, <laughs> and, and uh, i know it's 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 nasty right? uh, that, that's um, one of those memes you know when shit ultra runners say you know like <laughs> yeah 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 um but it, it's it's the sort of thing that i will tell myself when i'm in a, a deep dark hole you know 50k into a 100k run and what it's about Accepting that you're in a difficult place, but also knowing that mm. there might be a worse time during this run, sometime in the next 50 Ks. Mm. Worse than that, it might get worse again. The beautiful thing is, it also helps you realize that it's all changing. There's mm. oscillations in there. You know, if it's if it's bad now and going to be worse, there'll be something in between. And it might be something that's better. Mm. I think the other part of it is. It stops you from moping about the difficulty that you're facing right now and just encourages you to deal with it. And that means you don't turn pain into pain plus anguish. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know, you just deal with the pain. Mm. You're facing a difficulty, so face it. And know that it might get worse, but somewhere down the line, it's going to get better. Somewhere down that's the right. line, this is going to change and it'll be over and you'll be doing something different. I often, when I was, I don't do ultras um, anymore, um, but when I was doing them, I remember uh, um, I used to sort of say, well, I, I know that I sort of cover about 10Ks an hour. And if, so if it was an 80K run, I knew I would yeah. be here to say I'd started at 8 in the morning. I knew I was going to be there at 4 in the afternoon. And if I was really battling at 10.30 in the morning, I'd just look at my watch and say, well, you're still going to be here at 4. Just keep going. <laughs> like, you know, you've got all day out here. Yeah, friend. right. Just, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's going to be ups, it's going to be downs. And uh, I loved. I love this. We're off on a tangent here, but I'm talking ultra stuff. But I remember I was oh. I was in this particular run. It was the, the Gobi Desert Ultra. I literally thought it could not get worse, and I wish I had your line. Um, get worse before it gets worse. It was right near the end. It was about ten k's to go, um, and I was in all sorts. But I was just, you know, I was holding on, and I was going for yeah. it. And yeah. about 10 k's out, there's a bloody great big river crossing with a sandy base. And I'm like, my feet do not want sandy water into the blisters and all the stuff that's in your feet after. Yeah, this was yeah. on the back of already five days of ult. Like it was, it was a long, it was 250 k race, you know. And I'm at the very end and my feet are terrible. I'm like, I'm not going through this water, you know. And I was trying to find a bridge. I went to the bridge. The bridge was broken in half because there was no. Right. So I went through the water and it stung and I had worse blisters. I was like, this is going to be terrible. I walked to the other bank. I walked 20 metres the other direction and there was a beautiful bridge straight across the river. That you'd missed. That I'd missed because I was so tired. <laughs> and I thought, oh, you tool, Leighton, just keep running, you know. 
And uh, anyway, I, I ran on, and that was near the very the very end of the whole race. But um, I think th- those journeys that you're talking about there. The other thing that I've always found is it just makes that finish line that much sweeter, and you're that much right. more proud of your own effort to control right. the you know control the uncontrollables and just deal with your own your own emotions. <clears throat> yep. Yep. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, Peter, I'm conscious of time. I, I want to I want to talk with you for hours. Um, let's do one quick story about the time you drove your boat into the continental shelf, and then we'll do the five <laughs> <laughs> rapid fire questions. So, can you tell us about the time you ran aground um, on the continental shelf and what the lesson you learned about fatigue? Sure. So, um, so we were at the very back end of a demanding three-month workup. We are preparing the submarine to, to go off on a, on a deployment uh, and we were very close to the finish. It was the final night of the final at-sea evaluation. We had just attacked a task group of warships and uh, we'd taken the submarine deep to evade patrolling aircraft uh, and to close the coast, so drive in towards the coast um, for our final test, which was to be a, an inshore operation at daybreak the next day. So I'd written a set of night orders, gone to my cabin, lay down and promptly uh, fell asleep. I woke up sometime later with what I describe as a, a fluttering sensation rising up through my bunk, so through my bed. I knew immediately what that meant, immediately sick to the stomach. I ran to the car. We were at speed and we were at depth. Um, and I had driven my submarine into the continental shelf. So we were now screaming along the bottom. Thankfully, we met you know, a gradient of shale rather than a, a sheer cliff face, but we most definitely found the, the shelf. What I saw at the time was that the, the crew who were on watch, literally moments before, they were entirely confident um, of the submarine's position. Um, you know, they, they knew what, where they were, what they were doing, what they were about. And they'd intended to, to stay at the ordered depth for at least another hour. And they could not comprehend or didn't want to comprehend what was happening around them. To help them recover that situation, I quite simply announced we were aground. And in doing that, I hadn't taken the submarine. I'm not given a particular order or any direction. But the response was immediate. They just sprang into action. They they did the emergency operating procedures for that, regained their awareness, um, and they brought the submarine to a, a safe position. So literally, recovery from the sort of crisis there was a matter of one clear and simple statement. Cut through the confusion. They were confused. They didn't understand what was happening. And, and it provided clarity of the situation, provided an acceptance of reality. This is the reality, guys. Deal with it. And off they went. So that, you know, that was a powerful lesson for me in moments of confusion and moments of crisis. You can't give your people anything more useful than clarity about reality and, and what the actual situation is that they're, they're facing. On fatigue, I had set myself, I'd, I'd set my people up there. We were at the back of a very long workup, an intense evaluation, and there's no doubt that I had, you know, fatigue management at the at the top of my mind. My mistake was that I assumed that, you know, if I had the wits and the energy to to write, you know, a set of night orders and draw up a plan for the approach and lay that all down, I just assumed that they had the wits and the experience to execute that. And in actual fact, many of my people were much more fatigued than I was, in no small part because they'd been working harder. And, you know, in terms of emotional intelligence, I had misjudged the effects of stress and fatigue on my people, you know, so I, it, it was a setup, <laughs> basically. Mm, yeah. Um, well. Not intentional, obviously. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think a lesson for a lot of a lot of leaders right now, because there are a lot of executives that I'm coming across at this point in history that are more fatigued than they realise, and potentially the most fatigued they've ever been in their career. Well, I think the other side to that will be understanding how fatigued their people are, and we've earlier had that little bit of discussion about the different levels of fatigue. Some mm-hmm. people in organised organizations are absolutely flat strapped 24 hours a day yeah. and really fatigued and, and others because of their role or, or their circumstances yeah. just aren't in that situation so there's some real variance there at the yeah. moment greg the other piece that i'd pull out of that is just on 
on resilience. You know, we survived that grounding <laughs> and it became a great growth opportunity for myself and, and also the ship's company. There was a follow-on board of inquiry, not very pleasant, but gave us a really clear understanding of what had happened. And once we were through that, it was a traumatic experience. And I think any traumatic experience, it might be sort of sharp and temporary like that, but it might be blunt and enduring like this pandemic. Mm. Trauma has the power to sap our energies, our, our cognitive and our emotional and our physical reserves. But, but it can also be become a growth opportunity, become a generator of individual and organisational resilience. Mm. You know, we grew together. As, both those incidents, that flood and, the, and the, the grounding, we grew together as a crew through the efforts of getting ourselves through those ordeals much more comprehensively than any engineered workup or, or evaluation. But a, a really important key is that beyond the immediate trauma, leaders have to create the opportunity for people to recuperate and replenish. They've got to create the opportunity for people to regain their strength and their flexibility, and that's what will result in a more cohesive and a more resilient organisation or, or group of people. But you've got to have that, that room to learn and rejuvenate and, and move on. Mm. Beautiful. Well, it's worth Peter, it's been remarkable, uh, a wonderful discussion. I'd love to um, keep going, but I've got about half a dozen questions I ask all chiefs. What's the next thing in life you're most excited about? So really near term, I had, a, uh, I had an ultra lined up for the next couple of weeks, um, the UTA 50 up in the Blue Mountains, but of course mm-hmm. it's been cancelled. Cancelled, yep. But I determined that I'd put so much bloody training into this thing, I was going, going to go and do something anyway. So I'm going to head out on the day and I'm going to run myself 50Ks and see what I can do in the absence of, um, of competition. You're going to get up there and find 100 other ultra runners <laughs> thinking the exact same thing. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if I'll go up there. I don't know if we'll be able to get up there, but I'll... I'll it might be running around track somewhere, but I'll, um, yeah, I'll yeah. knock out the car. So. Good. Fantastic. <laughs> Peter, what's the best way for people to connect with you? Is that LinkedIn or? It is probably the simple. Yep, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. up there. There's, um, I think my email is up there, but LinkedIn's yeah. easy. Yeah. I'll put your profile uh, link in the show notes so people can get that if they want to connect. What is a final message of wisdom and hope you think is vital for the next generation of executives, chiefs and captains? I think it's got to do with courage. Um, and I think what I would say is don't add to the fears of your people. You know, in, in all that you do and say, give them the courage to face what threatens them. Mm. Well, that's going to make me think for hours. <laughs> that's so good. <laughs> what a fantastic finish. Peter, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on The Inner Chief. Thank you for your time and your wisdom. Not at all, uh, Greg. Really enjoyed the conversation. Um, and I hope your, your listeners get something out of it. Um, I know they will. Thank you. Righto, Chief. That sums it up for this week. All the links and resources we talked about, including more information on the Inner Chief podcast, can be found at the page for this episode, chiefmaker.com forward slash 176. Now, Chief, if you're yet to rate the episode and subscribe, I hope you'll do so soon. It helps others see the magnificent value that the chiefs and gurus on the show bring to their life and career. So make sure you hit subscribe on your podcast app now, give it a five-star rating if you think it's worthy, and leave a short review about your favourite episode. And as always, remember to stay epic.